Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Agrib's first ever webinar in the US on running the ranch, economics and profitability. Very, very excited to be running this webinar, our first ever webinar in the US. Um, my name is John Fargo, one of the co-founders here uh, at AgriWeb. Very excited to be uh, hosting with you tonight. Um, and I'll give you a, a very quick um, background on myself and AgriWeb shortly. Um, and before we do that, I just want to run through what we're gonna share with you today. So I'm just gonna share my screen. So hopefully you can all see my screen. Uh, there's a little bit of a lag, but when that loads, um, you'll be able to see uh, on your screen our topic for this evening again, which is running the ranch economics and profitability. Again, this is the first of the series that we're gonna be running uh, across running the ranch. It's a, a timely um, topic as we believe that everyone's starting the year, kicking off their planning. It's always a good spot to start in terms of understanding what makes your business sing. So in terms of tonight, um, we're gonna to be running through some introductions, uh, myself and our two guest speakers. Uh, we're then gonna go through why we ranch, uh, the current state of the industry, uh, an overview of profitability in ranching, uh, we're then also going to go and give you a quick snapshot uh, of, of Agro, a, a bit of a product demo. Obviously, a, we're a ranch management software that can drive uh, profitability through the ranching. So we are going to uh, run over that with you. And then we're going to finish with some, some Q&A at the end. Uh, there'll be an opportunity to have questions throughout. So in terms of that, uh, a little bit of housekeeping uh, in Zoom, you'll be able to see at the bottom of your screen, you'll see there's an opportunity with a and a Click on that, fire in your questions. We will do our best to answer them uh, and respond throughout. And then of course, at the end, we'll hopefully leave 15 or 20 minutes to really get into some in-depth discussion. Uh, we normally have so many questions uh, that we don't get them to all of them. So there is the ability to, to upvote these questions uh, in the bottom right-hand corner as well. So if you really wanna see something answered, make sure you go in there and vote uh, and we'll do our best to, to cover that off. Um, but, but really exciting to have you all on for any of those Twitter followers. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter as well as the session goes through. So we're going to be with you for about 90 minutes today. Um, you know, our guest speakers will, will speak for 15 or 20 minutes on, on the topics. Uh, and then, of course, we're going to have that, that demo at the end. So we'll be with you for about 90 minutes. We'll, we'll also be recording this session. So uh, anyone that registered will receive this recording. Uh, they can go back and look at it another time. Uh, and at the end, we'll also send a survey out to, to everyone just to see how you found the webinar, if it was valuable, uh, what you'd like to see in the future and those types of things. Uh, so that's just a little bit of uh, housekeeping from, from our end. Uh, and then onto, onto the speakers. So, uh, you know, we have with you, obviously myself, which will go through a bit of my background. Uh, we've also got Kobe Buck, uh, who's a, an agri account manager here. Um, he's a fifth generation cattle rancher. He grew up on, on Ray Ranch, which is a commercial Black Angus operation in Eastern Colorado. Uh, Kobe joined AgriWeb uh, in March of last year and, and helped kick off our presence in the US, which I'll talk about, which we're really, really excited about. Uh, and he's going to cover off with you today uh, why we ranch and the current state of the industry. So welcome uh, on board, Kobe. And we've also got Travis Maddock, um, who is the owner of uh, Dakota Global Consulting. So Travis also uh, has a family owned ranch uh, called Maddox Ranch in North Central North Dakota. Uh, he also runs Dakota Global Consulting, which is kind of a meat and food compliance uh, consulting group. And look, we've been working with Travis now for a good couple of years um, and, and the journey of, of Agri getting into the US. Uh, Travis has been very, very helpful in understanding the industry. Uh, working with some of our early early ranching clients and beta clients. So we're really, really excited to have him on board. Uh, and his area of expertise tonight is going to be on sort of covering off these pillars of, of running a successful ranch. As I said, we're going to be doing a number of these. And tonight's is obviously on the financial health uh, and what drives profitability. So we welcome Travis along. We're very excited to have him uh, and excited for what he is going to go through with us tonight. Uh, <clears throat> I guess I just wanted to give you a bit of background from my perspective. So 
Um, you know, we started Agro uh, about six years ago. I'm I'm also a fifth generation uh, sheep and cattle rancher, actually, from Australia. So you can probably tell my, from my accent that I'm from uh, from a long way south than most of you guys. Uh, and this is a picture here of, of our family ranch. And, and I guess growing up, you know, I looked at what we did in the 50s, 60s and 70s within our business. And, and I saw, you know, we went from having, you know, staff of 40 all on horseback across our ranch was about 400,000 acres. Everything took weeks to months to do anything. And then as technology evolved into motorbikes and, and then aeroplane, major transformational changes in terms of efficiencies uh, and innovation. When I look back now in the last take 10, 20, 30 years, we haven't seen that same step change in innovation. And, and I'm not just talking about from our personal perspective, I mean, from a, from a global livestock industry perspective, we're still very much running our businesses uh, you know, in a very generational format. And, and also, you know, in a, in a way that is not going to deliver on the demands that, that are in front of this industry. And, you know, the crux of this is really 90%, you know, of, of livestock producers globally that we see are running their business on pencil and paper. Um, and, and a lot of these businesses do not have a good handle on basic inventory and the drivers of these businesses to, to then deliver on a profitable business. And, and one of these factors, when I look for, um, you know, for, for some tools to help our business understand livestock industry, understand what's working, what's not, the inputs, the outputs, and all of those items that, that Kobe and Travis are gonna talk through, I look for some software for our business. And ultimately this was always on the market. It was desktop legacy based software that you'd have to get home at the end of a long day. You'd have to enter a lot of information but you weren't getting any insights to help you make decisions, to help you make data-driven decisions. So ultimately at Agrib, this is what we do. You know, we solve for that day-to-day -day record and data capture while standing in field, while standing in the pasture, we replace that paddock book um, with a very simple and easy to use mobile uh, app, which captures everything across the ranch. Uh, and then once that information is captured, it's delivered uh, in ways that can then help you make, you know, those data-driven decisions and, and move your business forward. So, you know, it's an end-to-end -end platform and we're really capturing everything, you know, across all of the animal life cycle from, you know, genetics, fertility, health and nutrition to weight and quality, uh, all of the pasture management side, you know, we're not, we're not beef growers, we're grass growers uh, and we need to focus on optimising that, that grass production in order to deliver on those business goals. And then there's a business layer to this as well, right? Which is about, well, you know, how do we make decisions off what's performing and what's not and linking in some of those uh, compliance elements as well. If, if you happen to be on some of those schemes, you know, gap schemes or organic schemes and those types of things. So really the value to the rancher is, is really simplifying that ranch management. It's eliminating that compliance piece, um, but ultimately it's improving the business. It's improving the profitability. It's understanding what's happening so you can take the next step uh, and create a sustainable business that you can pass on to, to the next generation. Uh, we know that there's a lot of challenges facing us uh, in the future and, and we need to get ahead of that and, and we need to make some changes. And, and here at AgriWeb, you know, we pull all of these tools in together. So, so we're, not, we're not just another shiny mousetrap in all of this. It's around kind of pulling all these different tools together so you have a one-stop shop to handle all of that ranch management integrate into all of your hardware, integrate into other monitoring systems. We have satellite imagery integration, hardware integration, uh, task management and workflow so that everything around your business is now wrapped up in, in the one spot. So where are we? You know, again, I mentioned that we, we founded the business about six years ago. Uh, you know, we're pushing on 14 million animals under the platform. We have over 5,000 ranchers using our product every single day. Uh, and, you know, this, this represents over 100 million acres. Uh, and, you know, we, we have sort of great, great adoption in, in uh, various geographies. But I think the exciting piece is, you know, we launched, um, did a soft launch late last year into the U.S., uh, amazing traction already. We have already, uh, over 150 ranchers already using our software, uh, over 2 million acres already. Um, and, you know, we're just getting started. It's really, really exciting. And we're looking to solve a lot of problems for ranching uh, on the ground and, and across, you know, across the globe, actually, we, you know, we founded in Australia. Um, we have offices now in Sydney, London and Denver, uh, where Kobe and the broader team is based. Um, but we serve as customers uh, all across the world. Um, and, you know, we're excited to kind of continue to deliver that global footprint. So, look, I might 
pause there. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Kobe now, who's going to go through, uh, you know, an introduction on, on why we ranch. So I'm going to drop my screen. I'm going to hand it over to Kobe, um, who can talk to us about his experiences uh, and ultimately kick off while we're all here today. Thank you, Kobe. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, welcome, everyone. Thanks for tuning in on this, this fine <coughs> Tuesday night. I appreciate your your interest in the industry. Uh, as John mentioned, my name's Kobe Buck. I grew up on a ranch in Eastern Colorado. We've been out there for um, about five generations. Uh, our family operations a commercial Black Angus Ranch. Uh, I was on the East Coast for a few years, and when AgriWeb came and decided to expand to the United States, I knew that being able to drive some impact and add value to the industry that I grew up in and return to my roots it, it was really something I was excited about. So quickly moved across the Mississippi, came back out west, and have really kind of been here since day one um, when it comes to AgriWeb in the US. Uh, tonight, I'm just gonna be kind of speaking to you about why do we do what we do, um, and also the current design of the industry. So uh, if you have any questions just based off of AgriWeb that, uh, and the material that John just went over, jump into the Q&A session. Otherwise, we'll, we'll take it from there and start to discuss our industry. So to kick things off, uh, just a basic question and feel free to answer it, but why do we ranch? Um, it's a question that typically comes up during a hard winter or a severe drought. And at least in our household, uh, every once in a while there's a few cuss words associated with it. So really asking, why do we do what we do? Um, I don't really think that it comes down to the idea of profits for profit's sake, nor do I really think that it's a life of comfort. So really kind of looking at the question, why do we wake up from at dawn, go to bed at dusk, come home covered in manure, skip lunch, and cab out heifers during the middle of a blizzard at 2 a.m.? Uh, looking at it from just those, those little anecdotes, it becomes a little questionable. And some people, especially on the coast, might think that we're a little crazy for, for dedicating so many man hours to this industry when uh, profitability is no by, by no means a given for, for most operations. And when looking at really why we ranch and thinking about that question, I really decided to approach this question from a personal perspective. So, this photo is from the back porch of our house. Uh, don't kid yourself. This is one, the one year maybe in the last decade where the grass was fairly green and there happened to be some clouds in the sky. So my mother took a picture and it's kind of been the desktop screensaver ever since just to remind me uh, why we work day in and day out in this industry, why that sweat equity is so important to us. Um, so as I mentioned, I grew up in northeastern Colorado, kind of the junction of the Nebraska sand hills that most people think of and the Great Plains that are often associated with Kansas. Now, a whole lot of people realize that uh, there is a part of Colorado that's east of Denver. And if you go as far east as possible and turn left, that's pretty much where we live. So our operation was a commercial Black Angus operation, mostly cow-calf. Um, and we've been ranching out in Eastern Colorado for about five generations. Um, unfortunately, to the disappointment to my parents, rather than going to Colorado State, I went to the East Coast for college and then spent about five years uh, on the East Coast working in energy and commodity-based supply chains. Uh, during those years, I really kind of realized how I didn't wanna live crammed into a small apartment, surrounded by concrete, um, and, and really not being a part of the, the backdrop and uh, the countryside that I grew up in. So fortunately enough, uh, John and the other uh, people in AgriWeb started to tease around this idea of expanding to the US. And I got in touch with them. And as soon as the opportunity presented itself, I returned back to my roots in the West 
decided to spend time on our operation calving out heifers as I started to join AgriWeb and really kind of define what AgriWeb could look like for the United States. So, uh, but, so like for me, answering the question why we ranch isn't really about profits. It's not a, about really um, the comfort of life. It's really just understanding our family's history in the industry, understanding that whatever it takes to be successful, to continue that, that uh, lifestyle and livelihood to the next generation was, was paramount. And looking at that as we go forward, I don't really think that the lens of what they've accomplished is something for me to personally be proud about, but definitely sets up the expectation and absolutely the obligation to continue to adapt these, uh, our ranch, improve it for uh, the generations to come so that the next hundred years will be better than the last hundred year years when it comes to ranching in Eastern Colorado. Now, pulling away from just my personal life, uh, really coming back to the question, why do we ranch? And luckily, uh, about a hundred years ago, Teddy Roosevelt had a pretty unique answer to this question. He says, I do not believe that there was ever a life more attractive than life on a cattle ranch. It was a fine health, it was a fine healthy life too. It taught a man self-reliance, uh, hardihood and the value of instant decision. I enjoyed life to the full. And as he kind of teases with the idea of living on a ranch, I think that it really at least resonates with me. It resonates with my family. I know my mom has it, this quote plastered across the living room walls. And I think that we ranch because it's not easy and it's not comfortable. And for us and, and for you tuning in, I think it's very much what makes life on a ranch attractive. Just being able to live and work in unison with nature, being able to survive off the land and potentially thrive based off of your own hard work and, your own, and the work of your family members. And then also this idea of self-reliance, being able to be liable for the decisions you make, whether they, whether they culminate in successes or oftentimes failures being liable for, for really what exactly those decisions have and the impact on your livelihood and being grounded in that design. It, ranching is definitely a challenge. I don't think anyone doubts that. But for those that decide to really dedicate their life to this industry, it's a worthy challenge at that. So revisiting this quote, Teddy, after a few years, um, of ranch life, he decided to retire on the East Coast by becoming president. And I think that he failed to finish this quote. Um, it's not just about you, it's not just about me and why we do it, but it's also this, this idea of longevity. It's about improving the land, improving, improving the land ranch to pass it on to the next generation. I think that when you couple these together, these values and traditions really explain why we ranch and also explain why many ranches across the United States are, are not just instantly started, but it's been a lifestyle and a tradition that's really been passed through the generations, sometimes up to six or seven generations. However, like bringing back why we do it and why we love to ranch in order to what is necessary to back back to how do we keep this lifestyle going? How do we keep um, this tradition going? And it all comes back to profitability. If you don't become, if you're not sustainably profitable, then unfortunately uh, we become a dying breed. We have to continue to improve our operations and to continue to improve profitability so that we can pass it on to that ne next generation. Um, if you have anything that I missed out, jump in the Q and A to explain why you ranch. Um, I would love to kind of hear from producers across the country on what's different from my perspective on it. And now really just looking at the industry and the current state of the industry, because I do firmly believe that we're going through a transition. And I, I would almost beg to say that 
we're going through a revolution. And the revolution is innovation and technology when it comes to the industry. Historically, if you look back, uh, innovation primarily culminated through the, the improved genetics that we've learned to adapt, the, the better breeding, the heterosis that we deploy on a lot of beef cattle. But as we started to approach the upper bounds of what we can do with genetics, we have to look for new innovations. We have to optimize our operations, both from a productivity standpoint and from a profitability standpoint. And I think that this is absolutely uh, incredibly exciting, not just for me, not just for AgriWeb, but, but for producers ac across the country, because these opportunities will, will culminate in more profits and, and it will allow operations to grow and increase their footprint across the industry. However, I do look at this and as is in many cases during a, a industry transition, there are gonna be winners and losers. Um, hopefully uh, all of us come on top, but it really comes down to the operations headstrong that against the change and against the consumer demand um, will largely be eclipsed by those producers that are progressive enough to be eager to improve their, their operation and curious about those new paths of profitability because there are coming, there are becoming more and more paths as opposed to just the local cell barn in which to market your animals, in which to purchase your animals and really streamline your management design. And I think that also gives us transparency into our operation. So in the old, old world, throw bulls out, calves come out, uh, you raise those calves, you wean those calves. And at the point where you have to start looking at grass before, before the next spring comes or uh, before your, great, your, your forage starts to grow, you have to market those animals to keep room for your cows. However, during this new age, uh, we'll be able to track the value of these animals throughout the life cycle. We'll be able to potentially utilize value added programs and be able to really kind of optimize our operation, especially as we deal with challenges such as the market volatility that we've seen with packers being shut down during the COVID era. And then also another thing that's plaguing the American West right now is just the, the sheer lack of rain the La Nina setting where we don't even have winter moisture coming into the ground. Being able to adapt to these challenges and preempt those challenges is really a, a part of this new age of digital agriculture. So rather than being able to, or being forced to sell your animals when every other person selling your, their animals during a severe drought and during its peak intensity, being able to track rainfall, being able to track how much grass you have out there and know if you don't get rain by a certain period, then you can front run that drought by two to three months and hopefully capture a little bit more revenue than if you were forced to deal with it the day of or the week of. Also being able to track just the cost of production that we put into each animal, really from birth all the way until it's off property. Uh, it gives you more transparency into just what it costs to make what your gross margin will be, and it will allow you to optimize your marketing period, whether you sell them at four and a half weights or seven and a half weights or somewhere in between, being able to capture that value for every pound gain and market your animals during a time that will increase your profitability and uh, optimize your revenue. This is all incredibly exciting. It, it's, it's why I, I came back to the roots. It's, why I'm passionate about driving uh, the industry forward into this new age and helping producers navigate just a changing environment when it comes to our industry. However, when it comes to technologies and innovations, um, one of the, uh, like one anecdote is when you talk to a lot of producers about technology, their mind immediately goes to the idea of utilizing drones to check water or to move cattle but in order to really have success with technology and innovation that's coming into our industry, we really need to have a strong foundation. Uh, even though it's not the most glamorous, just being able to have transparency into your operation and understand 
what additional costs have on the effect of your profitability. Uh, that's essential. It's essential for every operation that wants to take their operation into the next generation in a better place than when they found it. It's also essential that we start to look at the industry's supply chain and really look at how can we build a better foundation for the industry as a whole to capitalize on beef exports, to capitalize on the different uh, supply chain channels so that we can t consistently add product and capture and preserve market space when it comes to the shelf at any real retail store. I don't know, I, I know that everyone kind of understands how our industry is designed, but I don't really know if they've imagined it in an image. Uh, unfortunately, our industry is incredibly disorganized. I mean, it's beautiful because you have great relationships with, with your, your hey guy, you have great relationships with people throughout the industry. But when it comes to getting stuff done, when it comes to looking at new pasture to lease, oftentimes it's, I got to talk to my friend's cousin's neighbor to potentially have a lead on some grass that's within 35 miles of me. It's very tough to find the solutions and answers to the questions that you really need to be answering immediately if you're in drought mode, if you're looking at your operation as a whole. And the way that the industry is designed in this kind of web of chaos is really concerning as we look at the larger challenges that we have as an industry. Um, Competition is not going down when it comes to uh, room on the plate. So always remaining at a competitive price point to the consumer. But additionally, uh, the population that we have to provide protein to, is gonna be 10 billion people by the year 2050. Being able to optimize their supply chain and maximize the productivity both on the ranch and throughout uh, the beef industry, it has to be a priority. Um, and also the propensity to pay uh, within the challenge of a rising population is we also have a rising middle class. Um, Asia comes to mind when, when you look at over a billion people have gone from material poverty in the last 20 years to uh, a higher socioeconomic bracket and they want to eat meat. They want a better diet. Uh, it's a challenge, but it, it's also a huge opportunity for our industry to to grow our market share and increase the, the number of pounds of beef uh, that we export. Another challenge that we look at is um, really consumers have made it evident that they want to know more about where their food comes from. Um, the positive of that is they're willing to pay a higher price. So in order to meet these demands, we really have to have a strong foundation when it comes to the conception of uh, to the beef product, when it comes to the, the initial supply chain node, which is pasture-based ranch management, being able to keep accurate records, being able to optimize your profitability so that the rest of the supply chain can work as planned. It's happened for about two to three years, I would say, six or seven, um, in AgroEd's lifestyle, but really seen it in the US for the last two to three years. But the supply chain is reorienting itself. It's becoming much more digital. Um, it, it's really organizing in a way that you can get your answers immediately based off of an ecosystem from an online platform, whether it's buying stockers to run through the summer or looking at seed stock bulls, all that data and the, the blessing of online digital ecosystems is you can find those answers and what works best for your operation pretty simple or pretty efficiently. Um, when it comes to just the on the ranch design, being able to manage your ranch financially from a production side of things, um, from a counterparty side of things, uh, we can do that all digitally and save that data as companies like Walmart and Amazon look for, for a, a more robust supply chain that integrates traceability throughout their, their design. Um, compliance is always a weird issue, but I think that the fact that uh, compliance and value added programs are always a controversial issue, but 
looking at the 10,000 pound gorillas at the end of our supply chain, they were making it apparent that they want a, a type of beef that meets certain standards, which a lot of us provide already. All we have to do is keep track of the records and potentially capture a premium. Um, yeah, and it could not be more exciting. I, I think that as we continue to optimize this, we'll increase profitability on ranches uh, for those willing to adapt and streamline your sustainable, pro, uh, sustainable operations throughout. So that's kind of the end of my spiel. Uh, appreciate you guys tuning in to listen to me talk before we get to the headliner, Travis. But real quickly, I just want to finish with what are your thoughts on the future of ranching? Do you have kind of a unique perspective that's uh, in alignment or contradicts what we've gone over today? Uh, if you do, feel free to jump in and ask a question or comment or vote on a question that is already there. Um, but I will stop there and hand it over to John and Travis. Perfect. Thank you, Kobe. Um, great overview of, of how you see the industry and, and the opportunities moving forward. Um, and I know Travis, uh, who's about to step in, is going to do a great job of filling the gaps of, of currently where we're at now uh, and what we need to understand in order to get a baseline. So, Travis, um, you know, love to hand it over to you to, uh, to, to take it over. Thank you, uh, John. Uh, thanks, Colby, for for leading into this. Um, you know, I I'm just I'm very bullish on on agriculture right now. Obviously, you know, as a rancher and, and as somebody who spends a lot of time in, in ag, I just I can't help but but feel like that the, our best years are continue to come come ahead of us. It's I really feel like the next five to ten years we're going to see just a, a, a tremendous opportunities to uh, to find our way uh, forward in ag. So I, I appreciate all your comments, Colby. I really do. I, I thought it was spot on. So, um, okay. yeah. And I also want to uh, you know I want to thank everybody out there that's watching the, the webinar tonight. We know how valuable your time is, and uh, we sure do appreciate you uh, you taking the time away from your family, your supper, or your ranch, and or even your favorite television show tonight to to spend a little bit of time with us. So uh, yeah, uh, uh, thank you guys so much. So uh, first off, I got a question for everybody. And uh, I think uh, there's a, uh, uh, should be a button at the bottom uh, that you're gonna, that you're gonna, there's a, a poll question that you can go ahead and and you can, uh, can answer, you can go in and answer. But my question is, is what is the average cost of running a cow in the US, running a cow calf pair in the United States? What do you think the average cost is, cash cost? to run a cow-calf pair in the US. I want everybody to participate. Now, I know y'all got smartphones. I know y'all got the Google. So let's just set that aside though. I don't, don't go look it up. Everybody just think, you know, what do you think the average cash cost of running a cow um, for a year is in the US? Go ahead and vote. And, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll come back to that. But you can, you can vote anytime I think and uh, can fill that poll out. So. Um, there you go. Get, get into it. Uh, you know, you you didn't join this just to listen. You've got a uh, you've got a job to do. So Travis has sent you on your way. Don't worry, you know he's not going to. Uh, there'll be a surprise at the end. You got, you got a little homework, John. Everybody's got a little homework to do here. Absolutely. Uh, you know, so uh, everybody, please participate. Even even if you don't have any idea, just kind of give us an idea of what you think it might be. So I think that it'll be interesting to kind of see what uh, what the answers uh, come back at. So. Um, Pillars of a successful ranch management. I mean, this this isn't mine. If, if it, it comes from uh, Burke Tykert, and, and some of you folks have probably heard of Burke. He's a he's a ranch management consultant uh, in the U.S. Uh, very very well written, very well read. Has, has spoken all all over and uh, published in Beef Magazine, so on and so forth. But uh, he really does a nice job of breaking things down. And and, and, and he talks about four pillars. He talks about financial pillars, which we're going to talk about a little bit tonight, but then he talks about production. And I just want to stop on that because I think it's important. I mean, most of us really like the production pillar, don't we? We really like our cows. We really like our pastures. We like our grass. We like, we like calving time, you know, um, we like working. Maybe we like working our cattle. Some of us even like making hay. Um, we all have our own likes and dislikes, but we like production. We like being out there on the land. And, and running cattle in some way, shape or form. And so where do we tend to spend most of our time and most of our mental effort? Well, we tend to spend it in areas we like. And so we spend an awful lot of time on production. 
And um, I'm here to tell you that the other three pillars are just as important. And so marketing, we think about marketing. Well, when do we market? Can, can, we, can we do something different to market? A lot of times though, we tend to get a little hamstrung in the marketing. We wean calves at a certain time of year because our production is set up in certain ways or, or we have extra feed, so we background some calves. But there are, there are marketing options. We'll probably, you know, at a future webinar, we'll talk about that a little bit. And he also talks about people and he talks about relationships and, and why that's so important. And it's not just employees, but family family dynamics. I've got some interesting family dynamics on our ranch back home that I'll, I'll, I'll briefly touch on. But I want to get back to the financials because at the end of the day, if we don't have a ranch that's profitable, then what's the point? If we don't have a ranch that we can, that's sustainable, that we can pass on to the next generation, that, that can help our families, not necessarily get rich or, 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 or even be wealthy, but can help us create some wealth, can help us create some net worth, that can give us some uh, some security. I mean, that's really what we're talking about. And so uh, let's talk a little bit about the financials. Um, let's see here. Um, what, would, what would most of you think if I told you that the very few ranches actually have good enough accounting systems to determine if they're truly profitable? I mean, would that surprise surprise some of you? I mean, it's true though. I mean, a lot of ranches and a lot of ranchers that I work with and they, they really look at things from a cash basis. If I have more money in my checking account at the end of the year than when I started, hey, maybe I had a pretty good year, you know? But that's just the cash side of it. Do we really take into account all the costs of running a ranch? The costs of replacement females, developing replacement females, the cost of open cows and fertility, death loss. How about feed inventory? Did we buy feed last year or, or have we bought enough feed to get our calves through the winter? So it's the first of the year and, and we look and we say, well, we've got, we've got extra dollars. We must have done all right last year. Do we still have to buy feed? Do we still have production that, for, that we have to apply to calves from last year? Maybe. And how about off-farm income? How much off-farm income did we truly have to take in so that our ranch can be profitable? I think these are all really important questions. And I think, I think the uh, quote that we see here uh, uh, lends itself a, a little bit to that. And obviously this, came, this is an AgroWeb slide. It, it comes from Australia, but he says, we can talk about market access till the cows come home, but the biggest impact will fundamentally be simple things like controlling costs, improving fertility, and then executing efficient grazing of our livestock. And 2020 was fraught with challenges. We all know that. The market disruptions we saw due to COVID, the extreme packer margins, which got a lot of people very upset. You know, the fact that retail beef was selling out, but it didn't seem like we had a lot of money coming into the fat cattle industry. Um, I'm gonna say this and, 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 and just take it for what it's worth, but false income, government payments, we had a lot of support from, from the government that, that created income uh, if you could participated in the subsidies, um, which is really false income that, that, that could boost your bottom line and really doesn't always give you a great sense of, hey, was I profitable or not? And 2020 could be a bit of a one-off. I certainly hope it's a bit of an outlier. I hope 2021 uh, doesn't repeat um, what we saw in 2020, but you know, 2020 had its challenges, but it also had its opportunities. It had a great opportunity for us to to look, take those challenges, and go. How are we going to be better next year? You know, you, if you get pushed down a little bit, you generally tend to look around and say, "Hey, how can I rise up above this? Or how can I, how can I get a little better?" And I always like challenges. I think I think challenges always tend to make us stronger. They say, "Steel sharpens steel." Well. We definitely got hit with the blade a little bit in this last uh, last year, and and so uh, hopefully we can come out of 2020, you know, forward looking. Um, I'd like to introduce myself uh, a little bit and just give you a little bit of our story. Um, Kobe had to put a a, uh, a picture of his family up, so I figured I had to I had to do the same. And and uh, this is this is my mom and dad and, and my extended family. We're we're only missing a couple here. Um, uh, six kids in my family. I'm the oldest. Uh, uh, everybody's happily married uh, so far. 
uh, 20 grandchildren. This was actually, this spring was baptism of our 19th grandchild, my mom and dad, and uh, the 20th came this summer. So uh, as you can see, we're just fraught with bless, blessings on our, on our operation. But you know, it wasn't always like that. I'm the fourth generation rancher. Uh, you can see the fifth generation standing here. I suspect pretty soon the sixth generation will start to arrive. Uh, may, hopefully not too soon. Um, yeah, we, we, we hope everybody takes their time with that. When you get to be my age and start having kids, uh, uh, you know, it, it's always great, but we always say, oh, well, just take your time. Um, back in the early, early 80s, uh, you know, my dad, my mom and dad struggled. There is no way around it. And uh, they were, they were ranching with, with, with my uncles and, and my grandfather and, and the ranch went broke. Uh, the, the farm went broke and, and my mom and dad, we moved off of, off of my grandfather's farm. We moved several miles north and uh, um, took over a share farm for all intent. It, it, uh, a landowner that owned some cows and, and we were able to sh do some sharecropping and, and uh, I was in my early teens at the time. And uh, you know, started with a few hundred acres and less than a hundred cows and six kids. And uh, it was a struggle, no way around it. it. We struggled mightily for many, many years. I mean, I, re I remember being a teenager and, and, and going upstairs and, and uh, you know, in the middle of the night hearing my dad sit up there, he'd be up there, he'd be having a glass of milk and a cookie and, and he was worried. He was just worried. He didn't know how we were going to pay the bills. You know, he just didn't know how he was going to make it through. And yet we always did. We always found a way. You know, we did took jobs as we needed to. We, we didn't have the nicest stuff. We didn't we didn't spend a lot of money. We didn't make a lot of money, but we didn't spend a lot of money. So we made it. We got through. But it was always a struggle. And it was it was late. I spoke about 1987, 1988. I remember and I was 17, 18 at the time. And I was starting to get a couple cows and and starting to partner with the operation a little bit. I remember sitting around the kitchen table and we had those yellow legal notepads and we just sold calves. And in, at that time we backgrounded calves for just a little while. We basically just preconditioned them. We straightened them out a little bit, gave them some grass hay and, and we sold them to a neighbor and we just sold our calves for 57 cents a pound. And uh, I remember dad looking at the, you know, just there just wasn't nearly enough money to go in and even talk to the banker. We were almost to the point of being done. And he just, he just bowed up. He said, you know what, I got to do something about this. And, and what he did was he went to a class and that class was an HRM class, a holistic resource management class that was being held at a local extension center. He spent two days down there and he came back and he had fire in his eye and he had a spring in his step. And he said, we're going to get this fixed because he went down there. You know what he learned about? He learned about cost. He learned how to evaluate, truly evaluate cost. Or he started to learn about how to truly evaluate cost in his ranch, he started to, to, to understand grazing strategies and the cost of, of grazing per unit and the cost of land and overheads and direct costs. Um, he got a real sense of uh, here's where we need to cut. Here's how we need to start managing this ranch. And those yellow notebooks, they just kept getting filled with dad. He would sit there and he would just, he would write out plans and he would work on what's it going to cost to graze a cow? What's it going to cost? To put up this feed and and we realized very quickly that we were an incredibly high cost operation we, we weren't big enough we didn't have enough units we were conventionally ranching at the time when we had tractors and loaders and balers and self-propelled wind rowers and and you know pickups and 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 stock trailers and everything that all the neighbors had but the difference was is we hadn't inherited anything we hadn't we didn't have a partnership with with my grandfather at the time and, and said, well, you know, you can use some of our land use. We were trying to finance everything. And it didn't, like I said, didn't take us very long to realize that we needed to make some some fairly significant changes. One of the big things we realized we were just spending too much money on feed. Feed is, is such a big expense. I'm going to talk about this a little bit in, in just a minute or two. But we moved our calving dates and by doing that we moved our calving dates into the summer we started moving them back and we eventually now we are into the summer on our ranch and what that does is it allows that cow to go in the winter and in, in the first and second trimester of pregnancy when it's cold now my ranch is up in, in north central north dakota about 80 miles from canada we have long cold winters so we can bring that cow in um in, in early on in pregnancy well our nutritional needs are far less we don't have to spend nearly as much money on feed. We can calve when the grass is green, when their nutritional needs, she can lactate when nutritional needs are their highest. 
So, you know, that's just one of the things that we started to do on our place. And, and, and as a result, we've got, now we've got a much larger ranch. <laughs> we've got, you know, four families that are working on that ranch. I've got two brothers uh, that I work with. My mom and dad are still there. Um, as I said, the fifth generation is, is in the picture. Um, we've got, you know, my mom, my mom is glad that, that she's got 20 grandchildren that can come back to that ranch on a regular basis and spend time. Um, this picture is just a, a, a picture, just a picture of a river valley, one of the one of our, our, our pasture systems. Um, I wanted to show just a couple of pictures before I get into a couple other things here. This is bale grazing, and this is one of our one of our practices that we use on our ranch. It's 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 a system where we set bales out and we allow the cows to go out and graze during the winter as opposed to having the cows in a lot and feeding them hay. We don't start a tractor. We don't have to have a bale processor. Um, we go ahead and graze and it serves so many different so many different functions on our on our ranch that that uh, uh, not only do we not have to have a lot of labor and a lot of uh, spend a lot of money on diesel fuel and equipment but then ultimately we've increased soil health and we've got grass that grows we've got uh, this these these two pictures are it's the same ridge that was when I was a kid we farmed and it's a sandy ridge and I remember having wheat on that field and the wheat would be about a foot tall and the heads would be about three inches long and there'd be a little bit of grain in it. And now it's a tremendous producer. And, and we basically fix that, the, that highly erodible land through bale grazing and using very little inputs, no fertilizer. Fertilizer comes out of the back end of the cow. So that's just a little bit of our story, a little bit about where, where we've come from. You know, the, the ranch itself is not perfect in any way, shape, or form. It's not always profitable. We still struggle year to year from time to time, but it's it's always getting better. We're continually improving. Um, it's growing, uh, you know, to, to where it, there's several thousand units there now. Um, we keep looking at new practices, but everything we do is div driven by data. And that's really the, the point of all of this. Everything we do is driven by data. It's driven by what what, what, where are our constraints? What are our benchmarks? And where do we want to go? And so uh, with that, we'll, we'll get into some of the other things we want to talk about with regards to profitability. But uh, I want to get back to this now. I want to see uh, uh, what does it cost? What did you guys think? What does it cost to run a cow-calf pair for a year uh, in the U.S.? So yeah, I have the results, Travis, and yes, um, we can share them with everyone just to see where where everything lies. So, yeah, if everyone can see this, um, a majority of people said between five hundred and six hundred dollars, with a good portion of people saying six hundred to seven hundred, four saying seven hundred to eight hundred, and only a couple saying the lower bound, which is four to five hundred dollars. Sure. Well, you, you know, uh, uh, truthfully, most of you guys are, 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 are right in the ballpark. And, you know, I kind of laid it right around there. Um, just pulled this off cattle facts this last week. Now, we don't have data through 2020 yet, but uh, this is a regional cash cow costs um, across the United States. Now, this is cash costs, and I want to preface this. This is the ca cash cost, not true cost, cash cost of running a cow. And you can see it does vary by region, but the average uh is is right around six hundred dollars so just a little bit over six hundred dollars but if you do look you'll see you know it, it costs me in north central north dakota much more to run a cow than it would say somebody in alabama or florida or mississippi um where they don't have nearly as much uh, pressure put on putting up feed um you know they've got a lot more grazing days uh, which is generally can you know that's a that's a lower cost so um, that being said, though, I do want to put this slide up there that livestock marketing information, the true cost of running a cow is closer to $900. Uh, it's just short of $900 uh, in 2019. And that includes things like the cost to develop heifers, death loss, um, things along those lines. Some of those non-cash costs that we don't always uh, figure in, open cows, things like that. So, and I, I want to say that because, you know, getting $900 out of a feeder calf this fall um, could be a little challenging. You know, feeder calves have been in that $1.30 to $1.40 range. So 
say you're weaning a 550 to 600 pound calf, I mean, you're barely breaking even on that um, if this is an, you know, on average. So I just wanted to, to throw that up there and give everybody kind of a sense of, of where we talk about benchmarking sometimes, but kind of gives you a sense of, of where you might fit in or where you might be with regards to what the average is in the US. So, okay. Let's talk about profitability a little bit. So, and this is, there's nothing new here. And it's also, it's not, there's not a lot of, of depth here because we've only got a few minutes and, and this is something we could talk about for a long, long time, but I just want to hit the high points on profitability. Cause I want, I want people to start thinking a little bit about, about what drives profitability on our, in our ranches. And of course, revenue is important. And revenue is one of those things, that's where it starts. It does, I mean, how much, how much cash do we have flowing into the system? And there are ways to enhance revenue. There's ways, there, there's, there's forward contracts, there's, uh, uh, there's uh, the futures market, there's, there's uh, you know, lots of different tools. On our particular ranch, one of the, the, the two things we do do is we do use some certain certification programs. Um, we're a beef cares program. Um, with the IMI Global. Uh, my brother, Justin, is also in the GAP program uh, for Whole Foods, which is uh, a, a little higher level. Those are certified, humane, um, you know, are, are you good stewards of the land? Do you treat your animals humanely? And, and what it is, it's the customer assurance program. It, it, it lets the consumer, the customer know that, yep, these livestock are being raised well, and they're being raised by good ranchers. Um, that's one way we do revenue. We also utilize uh, video auctions and things like that, but that's really what I'm, not what I want to talk about. What I really want to talk about is cost, because I really feel like that the low hanging fruit for most ranches is coming uh, is, is evaluating their cost, evaluating their cost structure. And so we really have two different types of costs. We've got overheads and your overheads, those are those kind of fairly inflexible costs you have on a ranch. There are things like land and facilities, you know, so your rent or lease or your property taxes, depreciation against facilities, um, it's labor and management. I mean, your labor costs. Uh, I want to just take a second and talk about labor because most ranchers that I know, they really don't value their labor uh, adequately. And in fact, a lot of ranchers or a lot of ranches will run a budget and then they'll look at profit as return to labor. And I want to challenge you to get out of that mindset. You need to get paid for what you're doing. I, we all love to ranch. I love my cows just as much as anybody. I, I, I love being out on the ranch. I love having, uh, you know, being in this business. But I, it's got to, I got to be able to get get rewarded for the hard work and, and and the good work that we're doing. Um, it can't just be well if I make a profit this year, then maybe I can pay myself. So I'm going to challenge you when you when you go into budgeting for your ranch, budget yourself in labor. Even your own labor too, not just if you do have employees, obviously they're in there, but budget yourself in there as well. What are you worth? What's your management worth? And, 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 and take that into account because then you get, you're starting to get a, a true sense of what a true cost is for running your ranch. Um, if you don't put your labor in, if you don't put your management fees in or, or, or however you want to, however you want to preface it, then you're really not getting a true cost for, you know, a, a true uh, picture of what it costs for you to, to run your ranch. And so, so I wanna challenge you guys to do that. Uh, overheads also include machinery and equipment. And uh, you know, the, the machinery can be very expensive. Um, oftentimes, you know, in ranching, we're competing with a farmer down the road for a piece of equipment, a, a front wheel assist tractor and things like that. And, and unfortunately, uh, sometimes they just have got a, a little advantage when it comes to uh, being able to purchase uh, newer equipment. So be careful of that. Understand that, that your machinery costs can get out of hand fairly quickly um, You know, when, uh, when you're talking about overhead costs. Now, overhead costs can comprise you know, between 55 and 75% of your total expenses. Uh, in, in, in a lot of cases, it, 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 it can be a big part. But there is one thing that we can absolutely do um, uh, to change your overhead cost structure, and that is to increase your stocking rate. And I want to say this is that land oftentimes is, 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 is a main component of your overhead cost. And if you want to reduce your overhead cost per unit, run more units. And how do you run more units while still taking care of the land? Well, you have a managed grazing system. You manage your grazing. 
a little investment in fence, a little investment in making sure the animals have access to water and spend some time uh, allowing grasses to, to rest and rejuvenate. And you can increase 50 to 100% your stocking rate in a very short amount of time, just in the matter of a few years, in fact. And that will drive your overhead costs down dramatically. But you can't do that unless you understand what your stocking rate is, how many acres you have, what's your forage production, what are the opportunities. And once again, those decisions have to be driven with data. They have to be data-driven decisions. It, 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 can't be, uh, it can't be supposition. You got you to gotta get a handle on that. And uh, you, know, you can't have goals if you don't have data. So um, direct costs, direct costs, those are your costs to produce. Um, Feed, feed inventory. Feed is by far the largest uh, determinant, uh, a largest direct cost, and oftentimes it's, a, it's the largest cost in, uh, in running a cow-calf operation. Really, your feed, your feed costs really depend on your land and labor resources oftentimes. Um, can you, can, do, you, do you have land to stockpile grass so you don't have to put up so much harvested feed? Um, can, you, can you get your cattle out on crop aftermath? Uh, on corn stocks and things like that to reduce exactly how much feed you have to buy. Um, you know, can you graze deeper into the winter? Can you move your calving season so you don't have to buy so much high quality uh, uh, feed like, like alfalfa because you don't need as much protein and energy uh, because your cows have lower nutritional needs, particularly, you know, in the, de in the dead of winter when it can be very cold. So other direct costs include like your vet costs. Now your, your, your vaccination program um, that should be what it's going to be, but oftentimes some of your vet costs that can get out of hand can be treatment. And, uh, you know, we actually went through this last year where we had a little, a little bout of pastorella came through the calves and, you know, sometimes those shots, they're not cheap. Uh, you know, antibiotics can run 30, 40, $50 a treatment. Um, you know, you don't want to lose the calf. So you, so you, so you do it, but, uh, you know, Getting, your, getting a handle around that, is there a way for me to prevent that from happening? Is there, is there a way to you know, have a good vaccination program so you don't have those types of issues? Once again, very much data-driven. So um, brush control, fertilizers, gas, diesel, these things are all a direct cost that, that you need to have an ability to analyze to see what it's costing you per unit on your ranch. And uh, these things are these are the things that we need to get our, get our arms wrapped around so we can really figure out what it costs to uh, to produce a to produce a unit. Um, I like this I like this graph a lot. It's very simple, but it just shows. So your your overhead that's pretty pretty inflexible. And yeah, the more units you produce, the more the more stocking units you get on your ranch, you can drive that overhead down. But for the for for the basis of being kind of sim simple tonight. We'll just leave it like that. We'll just say, hey, you know what? Your overheads, what it costs for you to rent your pastures, to have machinery on your place and to pay you and uh, your employee, that stays pretty, pretty much the same. At that point, then your costs start to go up, your total costs go up because your direct costs kick in. And so those are once again, feed, vet, fencing supplies, fuel, things along those lines. Then you got your revenue and your revenue, of course, is gonna increase as production increases as well. Your break even then is where your revenue line crosses that direct cost line. That's where you're breaking even. And now the resulting V you get there, that's your gross margin. And what we want to look at, we want to look at how do we increase our gross margin? And there's a couple of ways to improve that gross margin. The easiest way is to reduce your direct costs or increase your revenues per unit. But the easiest way oftentimes is to get a handle on your direct costs and get your direct costs in line with what you can actually afford. So um, other ways that, that we can uh, increase profitability then is to decrease overheads. And really one of the easiest way to decrease those overheads is to increase units. And you increase units through planned grazing. Having a grazing management plan so that you can have more livestock on the same amount of land with the same amount of labor. Now we're driving down those overhead costs per unit and we're creating more net margin, so. Um, Kobe put this slide together and I really liked it. And the reason I really liked it is because it's interesting that, and I didn't even give him the questions, but he put these questions on there. And I said, well, these are all questions that we've had to answer on our ranch over the past 30 years. 
And there, there are things that we've had to talk about. And I'll just, I'll give you a, a couple of quick examples. Like, should I buy or develop these repl replacement heifers, right? And so in the late, in the early nineties on our place, we were, we had these share cows and our, and our landlord had come along with, we were growing this, the, the, the cattle herd up to where we had a few hundred cows and, and a number of them belong, belong to our landlord. And same thing, we're sitting around the table and we're looking at, at, at you know, our, our net and we're trying to figure out, we're like, this doesn't, something's not adding up. We should be, we should be making more money. It doesn't feel like, like we have quite enough, enough uh, net, uh, net margin here. And uh, turns out that what we were doing is, is we had missed a step in the agreement with our landlord. So. The landlord, we were keeping replacement females and he was buying the, his half of the, of the heifers back from us. And then we were putting them into the herd. But what we weren't doing is we weren't getting paid to develop those bred females up to time of breeding. So if that heifer was open after we had kept her for another year, we ran her through a breeding cycle, he got all of the money from selling that heifer and so on and so forth. And if that heifer came open after her first calf or second calf, and a lot of second calvers can be open females, we were culling those females for fertility reasons, but he was getting all of the cull, all the salvage value out of that female. And we were getting very, we, we simply weren't recouping our costs for having to pay for developing that female. It took us a couple of years to understand this. But once we did understand it, of course, we went back to the land, our, our, our landlord and the guy that owned the cows. We had that conversation, he totally understood, we fixed it. And, and, and took care of that. But it's one of those things, there's so many hidden costs in developing these replacement females that we don't think about. They kind of get passed into the cow herd. And, and we should take a, a real hard look at, is it profitable to develop heifers or should we just buy bred heifers? The, uh, the other question on here was, should we run yearlings? Should we run stalker, cattles and, or stalker uh, cattle instead of, of cow-calf operation? And we were in the late 90s and we, once again, we, we'd, we'd built our herd up to uh, you know, a few hundred cows. And, and, and once again, we were looking at the books, we're sitting down with those yellow notebooks and looking at our year end and, and uh, gosh, just felt like there, we were missing something. Like there was some hidden opportunity there. And once again, you do a deep dive into the data. What we're really seeing was that our feed costs for these cows, even though we had moved calving and everything, it was just, it, 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 there's so much pressure on us in North Central North Dakota. And we got to looking at our stocking, we got to looking at our pasture conditions. And what we had done is we had taken a lot of former farmland and we'd converted it into tame pasture. We'd put it into alfalfa and grass and we were grazing that. We were, we were using those as pastures. And they, and they were powerful pastures, tremendous energy and protein uh, being grown in these pastures. And we got to looking at that and we realized that why were we buying all this hay or putting up all this hay and keeping these cows through the winter when our photo period in the summer is incredibly long, I mean, the sun, and I'm in, in, in Benson County, North Dakota, the sun comes up at five o'clock in the morning, doesn't go down until 10 o'clock at night in the summer. And we've got, we can grow tremendous amounts of grass in the summer and no grass in the winter. Why do we have a lot of cattle around in the winter? And so we converted a number of those cow-calf units into yearling units, into stalker units, grass yearlings. And it really made a difference in, in our overall profitability. We, we, and not only that, but it gave us another class of livestock to, uh, to be able to market and, and utilize grass. And it, it, the other thing it helped us with is, is drought management. Uh, if we were dry, we could simply not have as many yearlings around as opposed to selling cows that we had invested money into that we had a lot of, 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 uh, of uh, equity tied up in. Um, because we were running, you know, we were running short of grass in a drought situation. So the yearlings actually became part of our drought management plan as well. So once again, a couple of these questions are just, it's interesting how they, they really spoke to me uh, because these are questions that we had to ask ourselves uh, as, as our ranch was evolving and growing. Um, I want to just talk, uh, I'm going to wrap up here uh, real quickly here. I just got a couple of things I want to talk about. Uh, I, I dug into some uh, farm uh, business management data, and I just want to throw this out here to you. Um, in 2019, once again, we don't have 2020 data yet, but in North Dakota, specific to my part of the world, our highest profit farm uh, had $144,000 of net profit against $400,000 of revenue. Think about that for a second. As I tell you this, that the lowest profit farms in uh, the farm business management program lost $101,000 against $475,000 of net revenue. So that means that 
the lowest profit farms actually had more net revenue coming in at the end of the day. Why? Because their cost structure is off. Is off. They don't know. They don't know their costs of production. They're losing money because they don't have control over their costs. They're making net. They're bringing in dollars, but they're spending it. And so, I just I find that fascinating. I guess that uh, that there's a lot of ranches out there that make a lot of money, but they spend a lot of money as well. And we really need to concentrate on margin. And and the way that we do that is, uh, oops, I screwed up. There we go. Is by managing our costs. So we need to improve that gross margin by managing costs. Need to know your direct costs on a herd level. Uh, Got to know your break evens. Once you know your break evens, then you can work on expanding those margins. Um, analyze the profitability or different different business lines. Think about possibly bringing in a different business line. I mean, so on our place, we've got a cow calf operation. We've got yearling operation. We also do some custom grazing. Once again, gives us some flexibility gives us a, a, a different way to bring a, a dollars into the ranch. And so um, analyze those things. But on the bottom there, establish your budget and goals, then monitor those direct costs and, and, and evaluate your profitability. Um, uh, but you really got to get a handle on, on what your costs are going to be. So um, I'm going to close by saying, you know, we talked a little bit about financials. Uh, I think we're looking forward to putting on a few more uh, running the ranch webinars through AgriWeb that we're going to talk about production, talk about markets and people. Uh, but with that, uh, I'll just close by saying uh, when, I, when I opened, I talked about Burke Teichert. Um, he's got a saying or one of the things he teaches in, in, in his, his seminars that, I, that really speaks to me. It's about every dollar you have is a tool, no different than a hammer, no different than a plier. And every time you apply that tool, there needs to be some result. And if you start looking at these dollars we're spending as truly as tools, tools that have a result when we apply them, then we can start thinking a little bit more about, hey, am I getting return on that dollar? Am I getting return on my, uh, on my investment into this ranching operation? So um, with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna turn it back over to uh, John and Kobe, I guess Kobe for some, uh, some uh, talk on AgriWeb, so. Perfect, thank you, Travis. Um, you know, great session there and, and really, um, some enlightening stuff. I mean, you know, we, we look at that quick poll then, and and I note you got a ninety five percent strike rate. So there you go. You know, the uh, every, <laughs> everyone's put a hand up to participate. But um, you know, like if we look at if we look at that, you know, that that quick poll, uh, and then you know we look at that data that you showed around the cash costs of being around that six hundred dollar mark, and then and then the true costs, you know, up around the $900 markets, it's kind of like a 50% increase, right? So it's, it's, it's a lot, it's a big number. And, and I guess I just want to get your views on, you know, um, what, why do you think people don't have the best handle on, on, you know, the actual, the total cost that is, is to run? And, and what are some of those barriers um, that are in the way of, of people really understanding that uh, and, and some ways to break down those barriers? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I think tradition uh, really does play into this a big part into this in John and, and you know, I learned how to ranch from my dad and, and if my dad hadn't gone off to to learn, you know, bookkeeping, to, to, to just put it bluntly, you know, he wouldn't, he wouldn't, he wouldn't have taught that to me and my brothers and I think that's a big part of it. I think it's, it's oftentimes, um, particularly if it's a ranch that's a family ranch uh, that, that might not carry as much uh, debt and you, you, the cash position can kind of can kind of fluctuate back and forth. We just don't feel the pressure, you know. You, you just don't get that that strong signal to get into the data, and, and it, it feels to me like that that there's a tremendous opportunity. So the beef business in the United States is a commodity business around the world. It's a commodity business, and by definition, a commodity business is break even. That means across all different all different operations and up and down the slide, it's going to break even. So how do you how do you create more profit in your own operation. Well, you got to be a little better than your neighbor. You got to be a little better than your competitor. And you got to find ways to create a little more value and a little more margin in the system. And that means that for every dollar you make, there's probably going to be somebody that's got to give a dollar because that, that's the way commodities work. And I just don't think that we oftentimes we just don't have uh, the background and, and, and the tradition of being being that type of manager. So I, I will say this, you know, over the course of the past 20 years, I've interacted with tons 
of ranchers out here in North Dakota and this part of the world that have that have broken through. They, 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 they're through the looking glass on this and they've taken these principles back home and they're applying them and they're being successful with it. They're applying these good holistic resource management principles and they're, and, and they're successfully running their ranch. They're, they're increasing their grazing uh, rates, their stocking rates, they're managing grass at a high level. And, and it, really, it really can be, uh, can be can be a big part of profitability. It can, it can make the whole difference between breaking even every year and kind of muddling along or really improving uh, the quality of life you have for you and your family. Yeah, absolutely, Travis. And, and look, um, obviously, we're, we're focusing on the US for this session. But, you know, I see it all across the globe and here in Australia, time and time again, you know, producers and operators, not actually even knowing how many animals they've got, right? I mean, you know, the fact is like, well, you know, it's about this, it's about that. It's putting percentage death losses against animals and all these types of things. So not having a clear understanding of, of the actual main business drivers um, is is a problem. And then we've got all the inputs and outputs. So mm -hmm. it's about having a really good handle on that and um, and in a way that's it's digestible for folk to, to get. You got to keep good records, John. I mean, no doubt about it. You know, and I, I'm guilty of it. I mean, there's been times in the past year, somebody will say, well, how, how many how many yearlings you're running? I'm like, mm, well, I, if I don't have my book in front of me. I'm not exactly sure, I, you know, and, and, and it, it can happen. And I, 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 I totally understand that. You know, it's, it, there's opportunities for us to do better and there's opportunities for you to be better than the guy down the road or, 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 or the folks, you know, a, yeah. a couple of states away. So uh, uh, we want to make sure that we get those tools in everybody's yeah. hands. And, yeah. So. Brilliant. Thank you, Travis. And um, I'm about to hand it over to Kobe, but uh, before I do, just a reminder uh, for everyone that, that's on in the Q&A section uh, at the bottom of Zoom there, fire in your questions um, and we'll have some time uh, shortly to, to, to go over them. We've got a few firing in already, which we'll cover off, which is great. So any questions that, that you've got uh, from the sessions, please put them in um, before we cover that off. Kobe, I'll hand it over to you to give an overview of the Agri platform and how we can solve for some of these issues that we've spoken about uh, in terms of you know, understanding the business drivers, but ultimately in order to understand that, you know, how we've got to actually collect the information uh, in a way that's usable, uh, in a way that's simp simple and easy. Otherwise, uh, if, if it's not going in, uh, you can't do much with it. So uh, take it away, Cody. Thanks, John. And, and thanks a ton, Travis, for just the overview of the foundations for, for any range to really be successful. Um, I'm going to dive into what we've really worked to build for, for AgriWeb. Uh, we don't have all of the answers, but just a brief, short kind of overview of, of the functionality we do provide for it. Um, but our platforms both on the mobile device, so any phone that you have, presumably a smartphone, uh, in your pocket, you can pull up your operations when you're in the pasture checking cattle. And then you can also uh, then uh, go to the web portal if you're really kind of doing a deep dive when it comes to just the overall performance of the ranch, what are your cost of productions, and really tracking how your ranch is operating from, from a profitability standpoint, from a, a production standpoint, and, and overall just from a holistic standpoint. So I'll briefly start with the mobile side, um, and then we will jump into just the simple record keepings from the pickup truck, from the pasture, um, how that really is organized and, and parsed to a way that's actionable for you and, and the, the stakeholders in your operation. So here is just a demo ranch that I put up. Um, it, it's a, a, a very, it, it's a good size ranch. I mean, it, it's a, on the larger end, but by no means does that mean that we're just focused on larger operations. Uh, we have functionality for everyone with 10 head all the way to, I mean, potentially 10,000 head. So don't be um, disheartened by just the size of this demo operation. It's fake numbers, but I'll give you a better understanding with, of what we try to accomplish here at AgriWeb. And the whole approach that we have is holistic. Um, your grazing affects your profitability, your profitability uh, affects your production, your pr production affects your grazing. Everything's intertwined in your operation. Um, it's not an accounting software. It's not just a, a calendar that tells you when to move cattle. It's really encompassing the, the ranches we know, it, which is a, 
a ranch. Uh, it's multifaceted and the design of it is fairly complex, although everyone often kind of thinks we have a simple lifestyle. Um, just at the main portion of the screen, this is the mob or the herd summary. Um, you can see here we have 100 bulls and roughly 2,200 head of cattle. Uh, we do have features that uh, are centered around individual animal management. So if you're utilizing EIDs or if you're uh, looking at uh, individuals and recording individual birth records, we have uh, a slew of functionality there to uh, help accommodate you if that's your management practice. Of course, um, no operation would be, uh, or no application for a ranch would be complete without rainfall and weather records. Although it seems like most of us put in rainfall a lot less frequent than, than we would hope, but you can simply add the, the rainfall records there. Um, the forecast, of course, where I come from, 0% chance of rain for the next couple of days. And then also down here, we have really kind of the, the employee management, the, the family management of what needs to be done, whether it's fix the electric fence, feed cattle, you can assign a task to a person in your operation. So as they're in the pickup truck, they know to throw in a couple of three bar posts or a roll of barbed wire to fix the fence on the way to the second gap peppers. Just really kind of diving into the 10,000 foot view. Um, if we click on the more details, we can really see the herd makeup and the number of head makeup on our ranch. So you can see yearling heifers, yearling steers, of course the bulls, and then the lion share would be the cows on this instance. Add additionally, we can look at uh, the, the cattle breed broken down by, I mean, you have a slew of different breeds, whether you're Wagyu or, or straight Angus or Simital or, or, um, or Brahmin, all of the functionality is there to, to capture what exactly is unique about your operation. Here on this operation, it's a terminal Charlotte Angus cross. Turn the Charlotte bulls out with the Angus cows and we have a, a terminal cross mostly meant for high growth beef as far as pounds and incredibility. Additionally, we can jump into our pastures or paddocks. Um, you can see the grazable acreage and the arable land. This is broken down into 100, roughly 120 pastures and we can look at the land use. So this operation has a thousand acres of hay and then the lion's share is primarily grazing of native grass. Um, moving on, just the fir first and foremost, I mean, it was a priority. It sounds crazy, but cell phone service was, it is worse in Australia than it is in the United States. So the fact that this uh, platform can work offline mobily, you can record uh, treatment records, you can move cattle uh, completely offline. And then once you come back in for a cup of coffee or, or come back in to uh, settle in for the night. Uh, it will sync up to the cloud and then you can report down onto your operation, whether it's production metrics, cost of production, grazing, all of that streamlined. So you don't really have to hassle with trying to write something down, probably on our pant leg or uh, the, the spare glove that we have in the glove box, write it down, hope we keep track of that information and then eventually coming back to put it into a computer. All of that's done very seamlessly. And we also thought it was paramount to treat the ranch as a ranch by having a map of the ranch and really having the universe center around, center around the ranch being operation as it lies. So we can see these are the different herds that I have across our operation. If I click into this 547 head, I can see that I named them the HC cows. Um, they are about 1200 pounds, 1 1.2 animal units. They have five days of grazing remaining. Um, the stocking rate for this uh, small pat or this pasture is about 3.6 animal units per acre. And so close it down. Um, if I want to look at this and see if we, what animals need to be moved, I can just change the view and see grazing days remaining. And it looks like uh, the, the group up top is, is a potential group that we need to move. So just going back to the default screen, I'll just grab these 927 head, put them into a small 160 acre paddock. Um, and then I can capture some forage metrics. So if we did roughly 1500 pounds of dry matter, set that uh, and 
course, my father has taught me to take half, leave half. We'll graze it to 750 pounds. And we can see for this large group and that small pasture, we have three grazing days remaining before we have to move them next. Save it down. Uh, from here, we start calculating the day's rest on the north pasture eight and the animal unit days accrued on the north pasture six. Um, additionally, looking at here, we have a paddock view where you can build out your infrastructure. You can fertilize a hay field if you would like. Um, some very basic functionality to include cropping, harvest, so that um, every operation has the ability to pull out the infrastructure, pull out the features that really mean uh, a lot to their operation. Additionally, the task side of things, we can see that I have a task assigned to me to fix that electric fence. It shows me the exact location of where that fence is broken. When I'm done with it, just click done, and you can show that task is completed. Now, when it comes to the cost of production, um, I know a lot of functionality that I just went through briefly uh, is mostly around moves and tasks. Um, and it doesn't really directly relate to, to the cost of production of the animals and the profitability of these animals. So what we do that's a little bit unique to the conventional design of at the end of the year, you look at your financial statements, dollars in, dollars out, what's my gross margin, and then just saying that this is a profitability of my ranch. We take that a step deeper. So we look at the direct cost, the cost of production and gross margin based off of the different herds that you have, based off of the different enterprises. If you have some stockers on there, if you have some replacement heifers, all of that information can be drilled down to the herd or individual level. So in this case, I'm gonna feed you CCC, the triple C cows, a couple of bales of alfalfa. Granted, it's 927 heads, so maybe a few more than a couple. I'm just gonna pull that hay out of my inventory. You can see that we have some 2019 alfalfa hay uh, sitting there and we'll go in and do feed supplied. We'll give them six bills of hay. That should be enough to keep them happy for a day or two. And then just save it down. What that does is it takes the cost of hay, whether you raised it yourself or you purchased it and took that pound of feed and applied it to that herd. So uh, the going rate, I think in the Western uh, states is kind of 165 to $175 a ton for alfalfa that cost will be applied to the triple seed cows or crew. So at the end of the year or throughout the year, you can see how much feed costs you have versus treatments um, versus death loss, and be able to really streamline all of that information. Um, additionally, like if we looked at this and if we wanted to treat this herd, whether it's a booster shot before breeding or you're looking at calves that you wanna uh, boost during preconditioning, you can come into these steer calves, treat all with um, uh, your, your inventory, pull it out, whether it's Alpha 7, Enforce 3, um, or any other drug protocol that you follow for this matter. We have some problem with some dust pneumonia, so I'll just do the, the Enforce 3. Go next, um, two mils per animal, a total of 368 mils applied to the group. Save that down, and what that does is it takes the cost of that, that dosage, applies it to that herd, so you can see your treatment cost across the animals, and it'll have its own unique cost of production for that group. This is by no means all of the um, functionality. Uh, this is just mostly what's relevant for the topic that we're discussing today. As I mentioned, we have herd and individual management, so really to be accommodative of any type of ranch design. At the end of this, I'll just go in, and you can see the, the the platform's already synced in the, the few records I just recorded. And when I come back home and pull up my uh, report side of things, we'll be able to see the treatment costs, the feed costs that I just applied, and a herd by herd break even for this operation. So bear with me for a quick minute, and I will jump into the website of the browser. So just switching to my screens, um, here is the, the website of the platform, very similar to the, the mobile side of the platform. And you, you can see a summary of your operation, um, the farm map, of course, 
all the and you can view based off infrastructure herds. But really, what I'm going to focus on just to stay on topic for tonight is the different reports that we have. So, if you're a sheep operation, we have crutching or shearing. If you're a cattle operation, of course, purchase sales movements. When you turn out bulls, weaning uh, records, all of these simple records. But all these records also uh, are able to roll into a more significant kind of financial perspective when it comes to management accounting, um, livestock activity perspective, or grazing infertility. So just by dragging and dropping a herd or clicking three buttons to capture that feed record, we're, you're able to give you more transparency into your operation and the different herds that, that make up your operation. So I'm just gonna jump into this livestock cost of production. Um, I don't have any sheep on this operation, but we can then see all the different groups and herds that I have on my operation. So the, the 2020 bull battery, um, the calves, the cows, and we can start to assess out uh, what, what side of the operation is dragging on the business, what side is the most profitable. So looking at this, the, the purchasing price, these CR cows, the 927 that um, I just fed, they, they were purchased earlier this year for, for a large sum of money. And then we look at the feed cost as of right now, it's early in the year, so only $600 of feed. And then moving through here, we also have treatment re records, the dollars associated with any death loss, and then any costs or commissions and sales can matriculate through. So you can really start to break out your your calves profitability versus your, your coal cows profitability versus um, the cost to maintain your bulls and your cows and understand where the costs that you uh, look at as far as the dollars out of your operation really are accrued on the herd level. Additionally, when it comes to selling animals, we have the gross margin side of things. So we'll give you herd by herd gross margin and uh, total gross margin for the operation as a whole. At the end of the year, most operations typically have uh, inventory remaining. So uh, just looking at this, if we, we can assign values to the stock that we have remaining, and it starts to give you that, that overall cost, the overall sales and the average cost per herd on a very basic level of the 10,000 foot view of your operation. Um, we have multiple reports when it comes to grazing fertility, as I mentioned. I just showed you and cropping if you want to look at harvest records or, or treatment costs, um, which is fertilizer and, and herbicides and pesticides. You can capture all of that information here. And we just want to be as inclusive as possible with as much features as possible to, to really kind of adapt the AgriWeb product to be relevant for any operation, large or small, small across the global design of the industry. I showed you, um, a, quite a bit of functionality in just this 10 minute overview, but um, depending on what your needs are, we can always dial back that functionality if you're just starting off with digital records, um, or we can, we can increase that functionality if you're very much uh, looking at more uh, hot, uh, like granular level management side of things, really kind of a menu design to, to the features and functionalities that, that we provide. I'll stop there because um, the last thing I want to do is, is push a product on anyone tuning in. It's more so you're trying to add value to the operations across, uh, across the globe and really kind of helping through a management design is the goal of the bagger web. But to live for the rancher, we have to provide value of the ranch to the rancher. And this is how we've approached that. Um, John, I might hand it back to you as we start to address a few questions and Brilliant. Thank you, Kobe, for that very quick overview, uh, touching on, on the core points relevant to, uh, to this session. And, um, and we are pushing up against time. So maybe we'll just run through a few quick questions here and then we'll, uh, we'll call it a night so folk can get back to, uh, to, to what they had planned for their evening. Um, so with I'll start, Shauna mentioned, uh, she, she, she had a uh, mention on the chat here that, uh, you know, she, she had a tough time uh, with her family keeping records. Um, and she would like, you know, for her son to kind of take a different approach moving forward as, 
um, you know, he, he grows up and Sean, like we, we see this a lot actually. Um, and, and really it's, it's around uh, looking to ensure we can uh, set up that next generation for success. So whether that's kind of bring them through that education journey early or adopting tools, even if it's not familiar uh, for that older generation potentially uh, and, and bring the family in so that they can help and take over that process. Because uh, ultimately what we want to see is, is that generation uh, having a good understanding of what they're coming into from a business perspective. So often it's really hard to get information out of, um, you know, parents or grandparents that, that might be stored there for decades uh, and getting that information into a platform that can be then shared with the wider business can actually be a crucial first step in order to, to kind of go through that uh, succession planning process. So great point that you mentioned there. And look, on this topic as well, uh, Bill from Texas uh, kind of put a comment in here saying, you know, I've got family members in my business that are a little bit older uh, and may have some barriers with technology. You know, how do you see people work around these barriers? Kirby, I might hand this over to you, seeing you have a lot of experience with, with speaking to folk uh, across in the US on this topic. Yeah, I think it's a, a naturally a little intimidating when you're looking at changing your habits and, and going digital as opposed to the, the age old tabbing book or pen and paper. But uh, you really look at how technology has infiltrated, infiltrated the, the other facets of our life, um, whether it's Facebook or being able to look up cattle prices on your phone. And really the way that we've designed AgriWeb at least is to be easier than uh, even a Google search. A drag and drop is pretty minimal. Um, the average age of a rancher in the United States, I think is 61. And our current uh, demographic on AgriWeb is 63. So over the course of the, the introduction of AgriWeb, both in the United States and globally, we've always heard this conversation, how difficult is it to adapt to technologies? And really, I mean, it takes a little bit of energy to change a habit, but it's technology is already there and we're already fairly literate across whether you're a boomer or a millennial, uh, the ability to just do basic things on your smartphone. Um, there's more technology in your pocket now than what landed on the moon. And so we kind of encourage start basic, start capturing move records and feed records uh, when it comes to AgriWeb, do the basic things that are the largest impact onto your operation. And then from there, we can start to grow our use of technology when it comes to on-farm to start to encompass other factor, factors that we believe are important. Yeah, I think that's spot on, Kobe. And, and you know, from my perspective, when we founded AgriWeb, um, you know, six years ago, you know, we, we came up against people saying, oh, you know, we're never going to use technology. We're never going to change. We're, we're recording our business on a pencil and paper notebook. Um, and obviously, as the years have evolved, you know, we've seen a dramatic increase in, in adoption. And look, the average age of a farmer here in Australia is 58 as well, right? So it's exactly the same demographic. Um, and what we now see is, you know, everyone, regardless of age at this point, is, you know, walking around with a smartphone in their pocket. Um, and the key to making sure that people can make that change is really ensuring it's really simple and really easy and visual and Kobe and I think you did a great job of showing how simple and easy AgriWeb is being based around that ranch map ensuring that it's it's designed for people with big fingers uh, that can that can really understand what's going on when there might be some you know a, a lot of sun shining down while you're standing out in the paddock so um, so we're really seeing that that actually you know the age is, is not a barrier at all um, and, you know, when you take that first step, it can actually be um, not as daunting uh, as one may think. And we can, um, you know, we can get up and running in a staged process uh, pretty, pretty simply. So I might hand over one quick one to, um, to Travis. And this is uh, Tim from South Dakota. So up in the Dakotas in your neck of the woods, broadly speaking there, Travis. Uh, and the question was, did you have to adjust um, how you market your calves when you moved to summer calving? So back on that, those examples you gave. Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, uh... You know, anytime you make a, a change in management like that, uh, you gotta you gotta look at it, you know, from a holistic standpoint. Yeah, when we moved our calving seasons into summer, then you know we had a much lower weaning weight calves, and and the little bit of background we were doing, we weren't getting enough once again revenue moving through the system, and that's when we another reason why we started running some summer calves, and so we we take our calves and we we get them through the winter. We we try to keep it as low cost as possible, and then we we let those calves really gain on, on our good summer grasses up here. So yeah, we, we've actually moved to now where everything's marketed as yearlings. Uh, we don't market anything off the cow or anything backgrounded anymore. So yeah, we, we had to make some changes though. And once again, it was data driven changes. So, yeah, perfect. And you know, the, the, with, with that comes different opportunities. So uh, taking that holistic approach is, is definitely the way to look at it. 
Um, one quick follow-up, one that's come through from, from Shauna again uh, around asking a question of if we provide this sort of content um, to, to schools and to education out there. Um, we absolutely do. Um, you know, we can get these recordings out uh, and run some specific sessions. We also have some academic plans. We have a number of um, high schools, universities uh, across the globe that use our platform as the core platform to educate that next generation coming through. Um, so we have a specific division that, that kind of looks after uh, and encourages that next generation to be ultimately moving with the times uh, and, and learning as they go what the future of agriculture is. And, and obviously the, the part we play is, is driving the digital future of agriculture. Um, so look, I might, um, I might wrap things up there. Uh, you know, we've gone a fraction over time, but um, you know, as, as we said at the start, very, very excited to, to kick off um, the first of these series uh, running the ranch um, on this topic of, of profitability. Uh, we think it's very timely. Um, we will be running uh, various sessions uh, as Travis uh, mentioned in the coming uh, weeks and months to kind of round out that holistic approach. Uh, so, you know, we encourage you to, to, to join and come along. Um, and again, excited to be launching and kicking off in the US. Um, we couldn't be more excited to, to be bringing this content to you guys. Uh, we hope you had um, a great time. And, um, you know, again, we'll be sending out a survey to get your feedback. Uh, please, please uh, give us your honest and candid feedback so we can um, improve and, and offer a better uh, session for you next time. So from all of us here at Agrib, we thank you again. Uh, and we will close off the evening uh, and wish you well um, into, uh, into the night. So thank you all. Yep. Thank you, everyone.